Well, welcome. Welcome everybody to the first nutrition and exercise physiology seminar of the spring semester. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Martin Kohlmeyer, our seminar speaker today. He is faculty in the UNC Chapel Hill Nutrition Department and director of the UNC Nutrition Research Institute's Nutrigenetics Lab and founding editor of BMJ Nutrition Prevention and Health. He has a medical degree from University of Heidelberg, and after medical school and residency training, he completed graduate studies in bioinformatics, clinical chemistry, and laboratory medicine at Heidelberg University, at the Max Planck Institute for Nutrition Research in Dortmund, and later at the Free University in Berlin. His research focuses on precision nutrition and nutritional genetics. He's authored several books on nutrition, biochemistry, and genetics, including Nutrigenetics, Applying the Science of Personal Nutrition, and Nutrient Metabolism, which is a textbook detailing the molecular fate of more than 100 food constituents. So during the current pandemic, Dr. Kohlmeyer worked on the role of nutrients in developing and sustaining immunity, including on the significance of adequate vitamin D and other nutrients for preventing negative outcomes of COVID-19. He's been the recipient of several awards, including the Roland Weinzier Award for Excellence in Medical and Dental Nutrition Education from the American Society of Nutrition, uh, the UNC Nutrition Department's Faculty Excellence Award, and the American Society of Nutrition's Excellence in Nutrition Education Award. So we are very privileged that you know, he's presenting here today. And please give a very warm welcome to Dr. Martin Kohlmeyer. Thank you very much for the introduction and the accolades. Um, I want to share uh, something that I've been thinking about more recently. Uh, that is about the need for categorical stratification in nutrition science, practice and policy. So really at all levels. So we're really talking about apples versus oranges. And this is a, a somewhat humorous uh, short piece in the British Medical Journal, uh, where the author, who is a, a surgeon, of course, who else would uh, write something like this, uh, was wondering, do we, are we really sure that they are different, uh, apples and oranges? Unfortunately, he found a difference, and that was uh, everything else was was the same, but there's an involvement of granny apple seed. So that's how we can distinguish between that. But in a more serious vein, I do want to literally have us thinking about uh, what kind of comparisons are we doing when we are comparing apples versus oranges? And of course, applied to um, nutrition uh, questions. So I'm going to start uh, talking a little bit about categorical variables and their nature. Uh, and then I want to follow four use cases on folate, muscle performance, lactase, and nutrition recommendations. And Without much ado, let's uh, think about what are categorical variables. So categorical variables are basically those variables that are not expressed as numbers. So uh, you see a few examples here at life stage. Of course, we can assign some kind of number uh, to that. We could pre-puberty, uh, pregnancy, menopause, we could assign each of them a number, one, two, three, et cetera, but it doesn't really make it a, a, a numerical variable. These are just proxies. Uh, and, you know, when we are talking about things like illnesses, uh, somebody has COVID or does not, or when do we talk about uh, medications, uh, where somebody is treated with uh, an antibiotic like moxicillin, but most people are not. So clearly, uh, these are discontinuous variables um, that we have to treat differently from the many kind of variables that are numerical. So let's start uh, thinking about folate. 
I don't want to get too much into the details uh, other than saying that uh, folate status can be approximated in many uh, settings by measuring homocysteine concentration in blood. Basically, uh, you need adequate folate intake to keep your homocysteine concentrations low. Uh, if you don't have enough folate, then the metabolic processing of homocysteine is hindered. And these are data from uh, a Framingham study uh, of an elderly population, this particular one, and it's simply divided up into deciles. So by uh, the, the folate intake, uh, on the left, you have the 10% the who have the lowest uh, folate intake. And then when you look at their homocysteine concentration that you can see, this is around 14 micromole per liter. On the right, you have uh, uh, the people who tend to have very high uh, diet, uh, folate intake, and uh, they have a homocysteine concentration for those 10% of around, in this case, 11 or so. You can kind, kind of see that you could approximate PERF through that, and uh, this uh, probably suggests that somewhere around 400 micrograms per day intake, uh, you are pretty close to the minimum uh, of homocysteine concentration and adding more folate uh, will not make much of a difference. So this coincides quite well with the current recommendation. Uh, of that people should get about 400 micrograms per day to meet their needs. But there's a different way to look at it. That is, you could do an intervention study. This is a cross-sectional study. And then you can see what happens if you start out with something around 400 micrograms. Uh, that's the P1 period on the left here. And that was done for 10 days. And then they followed it up with a depletion period for a month uh, with only about 25 micrograms per, per day, which is way, way below uh, what we think um, somebody needs in terms of folate, uh, folate intake. And then uh, they repleted the people, and uh, for a couple of weeks, they uh, did it uh, again at 400 plus micrograms per day. And then they repeated the whole thing. So P5 is the next uh, depletion study. So P1 and P4 is adequate, P2 and P5 is depletion. And you can see there's a tendency uh, that the homocysteine concentration, as we might expect, uh, increases uh, by the time they, they have been depleted for a month. And then mm -hmm. homocysteine concentration goes down again. It's not so straightforward when we look at it in detail by individual. And particularly in this case, we have the luxury that we see repeat experiments, which we don't do enough. And then we see, for instance, there are two individuals, the ones indicated with the green lines, uh, where homocysteine doesn't change, right? So if you look at day 10 and day 40, the values are the same. And then you repeat the same individuals. That's uh, on P5. And again, no change. On the other hand, there's one individual indicated with a blue line that has a particularly high increase. And this increase, pretty much same extent, is repeated with the replication. 
And most of the others are somewhere in between. Uh, and again, you have to trust me there, uh, the replication is pretty good. They, if they had you know, one change in, in the first period, they had a very similar change in the, in the following period. So what is going on there? Clearly, people respond differently to uh, different levels uh, of folate intake. So some people are very sensitive to depletion, like the blue one. Others, it's almost as if it was not a vitamin. It was not needed. They could do without. We don't know. And that's amazing because nobody would tell you that 25 micrograms uh, is anywhere close to what we need. So that already gives us some idea that there uh, are, are differences in how people behave. We should not um, just assume that they are all the same. So this is just a very simplification of the pathways that relate to folate metabolism. And one of the key reactions is uh, where the, the uh, 510 methylene, methylene uh, tetrahydrofolate form is converted by uh, MTHFR, methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase, uh, into 5-methyl THF. So th th that 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate is the active form, which is then contributing to the remethylation of uh, uh, homocysteine. That's why if you cannot remethylate homocysteine, that concentration uh, increases. This is remethylated to methionine, and methionine is used for methylation reactions. We don't have to get into detail. We just have to take focus on that MTHFR variant. And sure enough, and we have known that for quite a while, uh, when you look at uh, the requirements, and this comes from a feeding study, uh, where different levels of um, folate intake uh, were used by uh, all participants. And you can see that the blue bars represent individuals who carry the 677CC genotype. With, that's the one with the high activity, and that's thermostable. And as you can see, there is not really very much of a change uh, when you go from the very low 221 uh, micrograms intake. These are dietary folate equivalents. Uh, so that weights uh, the different forms of folate a little bit. Um, so if they have this low intake, if you look at it, there is not much of a difference uh, compared to very high intake. In contrast, if you look at the people with the ET genotype, the gray bars, you can see at the low intake level, they have much higher homocysteine concentrations, and it takes quite a bit, probably more than 600 micrograms uh, DFE to really get to a level where, where you have sufficiency, right? And even at the 800 uh, intake level, they are still higher than the blue bars. So there is a, a very distinct difference. So probably those are the people who respond very differently. Some don't need very much. There are other genetic variants that explain particularly the very low requirements, other people need much more. And when we look at it, and you might say, well, okay, why should I worry about this? Uh, why would I care? Uh, that is because we know that there are a number of consequences. Uh, and one of the certainly important ones uh, is increased breast cancer risk. I don't want to get too much into the details, but uh, you see with these different forms uh, in 
uh, a very important um, nested case control study, pretty much uh, in each case, whether we look at the dietary folate or the combination of folate supplements plus uh, food folate, uh, there is a statistically significant difference uh, for total folate, folate about fourfold difference and risk. In other words, if you get enough folate, then you have a lower risk. But this applies mostly to the individuals with the TT genotype on the right, where I encircled uh, the, the uh, odds ratios. It does not make as much of a difference, if any at all, in the people with the CC genotype. That's what we would expect, that they just need more uh, if they have a TT genotype. That's what we saw before. It applies to homocysteine, but it also applies to something more consequential and uh, more health-linked uh, as breast cancer. And this is another uh, uh, result from a very large European breast cancer study, uh, the EPIC cohort. And what you can see here, the blue line, if you follow the blue line from very low intake levels on the x-axis, then as uh, folate intake increases, the uh, risk of getting breast breast cancer decreases, so the hazard ratio uh, decreases, and it reaches a minimum around 350 or so, 340 micrograms per day. But what you see then is that there is then apparently an increase of risk again. What's going on there? And basically, it points us to another uh, common genetic variant, this one in the DHFR uh, gene. And this gene encodes the dihydrofolate reductase enzyme. And about 20% or so of the American uh, population has a form, a deletion form, two copies, uh, is significantly less active. This means that folic acid cannot be efficiently activated, but also spent uh, folate can also not as efficiently reactivated. And the consequence of this, this comes from a large um, uh, long-term uh, cohort that was followed up uh, over uh, many years. The consequence is those women in that cohort who had this uh, del del the deletion, the less active version, and who consumed multivitamins or other vitamin supplements with folic acid. They had breast cancer risk that was more than 50% higher than if they did not use that supplement. So it's not uh, a clear benefit to them. Uh, in this particular case, using the supplement was harm for those who have this particular genotype. And here are just the numbers. I think, you know, it's easier to, to think about it in terms of fold differences, but uh, basically you can see the effect on, of the vitamin users and uh, the, the lower, uh, in the middle, the lowest row gives you the 1.52 that indicates increased risk for breast cancer. If you use uh, these folic acid supplements and at the same time are a carrier of this particular deletion variant, the minus minus. And this is confirmed uh, in a different context. So this relates to colorectal cancer, recurrence and survival. And uh, you can see that um, 
individuals who have, uh, sorry about that, uh, they have uh, unmetabolized folic acid um, that they have uh, an increased risk. So that's the key three lowest uh, row in this table. They have the highest uh, risk uh, compared to the people who uh, have low folic acid use. And basically, you can have folic acid only in circulation if you use a dietary supplement with folic acid because there's, there are no food sources unless it comes from fortified uh, uh, food. So here again, we have the same thing. We can assume that most of those people with the increased folic acid concentrations actually have these uh, low activity DHFR variants. And therefore, if they use supplement, uh, it appears that both uh, their risk of death here, also their risk of recurrence, the same thing. Look at the bottom with the T3. Um, so the crude uh, hazard ratio is uh, 2.59, adjusted one. Uh, is more than threefold. So they have a, a distinctly increased risk. And here comes another uh, confirmation from the same study. Basically, the individuals who actually report using folic acid supplements, they have an increased risk uh, somewhere with around one and a half fold for these outcomes. So we have to think about it, not everybody benefits the same uh, from uh, use of these supplements. And uh, we may have to take that into account because they may get more harm than benefit if they are at risk. I'm going to go very quickly through the next couple of examples and um, let me know if I need to focus on something or if you have questions that need urgent clarification. So this is another uh, example, a use case, looking at what happens when somebody otherwise healthy does intense exercise. In this case, we looked at uh, healthy men. Uh, young, uh, middle-aged, not very old, and they're all in, in good shape. But what we knew and why we did this, some people are at increased risk of if they do intense exercise, like here we do a particular uh, protocol, eccentric uh, elbow flexor exertions, like you see this woman demonstrate here, is the machine that we are using. They have to basically work against the machine. And for some people, that has the effect that uh, some of their muscle cells are breaking down. Now, let me emphasize this. This is an exercise that we do for 12 repetitions, which takes just a little bit over one minute. So, this is, uh, the repetitions are at about 80% uh, maximal strength. So it's not, I mean, it shouldn't really be so terrible. You can try it yourself. Uh, the point is after eight or nine repetition, it gets really hard. And then um, the muscles start breaking down. So we compare uh, before we, we do the exercise with what happens three days later. And we get a marker, creatine kinase, that's the CK, uh, that indicates muscle uh, breakdown. So this is called uh, delayed onset uh, muscle soreness, DOMS, and it's a pretty good measure of performance. And what we see is, we identified particular genetic variants in the muscle uh, creatine kinase gene. And uh, the allele frequencies are close to 50% either form. 
And, you, and when you look at the CK before in the first column on leftmost column, then you can see they're all about the same middle range, somewhere mid 160s, uh, a little bit over 200, all within the normal range. That's what you would expect. But when you look at what happens three days after this intervention, then you find that uh, the people who have the AA genotype, they have really a massive increase uh, in CK activity. In this case, mean of 2,600 something. Sorry. And um, compare this to the people who have the TT genotype, right? The 16 uh, on the left. They have basically no effect. And you can see uh, the TT at a 1.4 fold and non-significant uh, increase compared to the AA who had like a more than 20%, uh, 20 fold increase, highly statistically significant. So I want to address one thing that is, you may have heard that term lumping versus splitting. How do we combine, particularly in genetics, uh, the different uh, genotypes there for most uh, variants that there are three genotypes. There are two homozygous ones, one for each form. And there's a mixed type, the heterozygous form. Should we combine them? And I want to share just, just food for thought, uh, if you ever encounter this, one example where uh, the investigators looked at the change in serum cholesterol uh, concentration in response to an additional 300 milligrams of cholesterol to a standard diet. And as you can see, when we combine uh, the genotypes four and three, so on the right, three, four plus four, four, and compared to the most common forms, three, three, then there's no almost no effect. But if you look at the individual genotypes, the three that I was talking about, the three, three, in the middle, the three, four, and the rightmost, Four, four, we see pretty distinct uh, increase in serum cholesterol concentration for the four, four. Most of the time, we don't see that because it's an uncommon uh, genotype. Only one to two percent uh, of Americans have this particular genotype, so it get, kind of gets lost when we combine this. Going back to the muscle performance, so you remember we were talking about the difference by uh, the, the muscle creatine kinase uh, encoding gene, and we said that once with the AA genotype, they were the sensitive ones, so I marked them in, in red, and when we look at the performance, the work performance, uh, we also see differences. So it's not just that you know that you have uh, muscle pain, but you also have less strength measured uh, as torque. So it's basically you know like in a car, the ability to, to pull or push something, and they have uh, after three days only about eighty five percent of the initial. Uh, Work. Similarly, for the total work was done, that was reduced to 82% uh, or so, and the average power also was uh, lower. And uh, when you compare that to the TT genotype, you can see there was almost no effect. So they uh, clearly had uh, an impact uh, when they carried the AA genotype on the ability to perform uh, even after little more than one minute of intense exercise. 
And again, it's not everybody has that. And uh, also, when we look at something somewhat unrelated, that is the kind of energy they habitually consume, it's remarkable that we can see that AA, again, that's the one with the muscle uh, vulnerability, they tend to have a very high uh, habitual uh, dietary intake, total energy, 2,700, compared to the TT is only uh, under 2,300. So we really have to uh, look at all these various outcomes. Not everybody is the same. This is something the individuals had no idea that they were different in any way. They would never know that. A physician examining them would not know that. A dietitian uh, examining them would not know that unless you really get the context of the particular genetic uh, genotypes. And going a little bit further, uh, we can sort these um, uh, variants. Uh, there are multiple ones around uh, the one we looked at. Uh, you might remember the second one from the right, that's the RS 344, 816. Uh, related them to uh, the uh, post-exercise uh, creatine kinase activity. And that's uh, the greatest difference, but uh, there were several others that also showed difference when you combine all five of these so that you have um, them all on the same strand. We call that haplotype. These are the variants on the same strand then there are two common or relatively common haplotypes, one and two, and one has uh, the C, for instance, uh, on the leftmost position. The other one has a T, a leftmost position, etc. And when we compare those uh, carriers uh, with the haplotype, and we looked at two copies of the haplotype one, that's on the left column, with the ones who have two copies of the haplotype 2, we see an even greater distinction when you look, for instance, uh, at the creatine kinase activity three days after exercise. If they had the diplotype 1-1, one, one, they had around 10,000 units per liter. This is a massive increase, whereas the people who carried uh, only the two uh, haplotypes, so that's the diplotype 2-2 two, two combination of two haplotypes, just like with the genotype, um, then it had no effect. In this particular case, uh, their uh, CK, their average CK was even lower uh, than before the exercise. And what you can also see uh, at the bottom, there was uh, a difference in lean body mass. These are very small numbers yet, but I mean, it's just to illustrate that there are consequences uh, of particular uh, genetic variants for how we respond to not only nutrition, but also to exercise. Next case, lactase. Uh, this is just a reminder. I'm not going to talk about the usual lactase case. So uh, what lactase does, uh, of course, it's needed to split uh, the galactose from uh, the glucose in lactose. And uh, this is particularly important uh, in infants because, of course, uh, milk is what they live on. They wouldn't survive if they didn't have a functioning lactase. But uh, there is a difference uh, once they get older. And the, what we now know, most common state in adults, about uh, two thirds or more of the total global population 
is a lack of lactase expression. And accordingly, most of these people do not tolerate lactose well. They can tolerate small amounts, but um, if they consume uh, larger amounts, they get abdominal discomfort, uh, flatulence, uh, et cetera, maybe even diarrhea. And they're clearly not adapted to the use of uh, lactose, particularly with milk. Now, this is nothing new. We have known that for a while. What we now know is specifically which variants are responsible for this. And we know quite well now that it's only certain regions where lactase expression in the small intestine uh, is common. So that's the, the, the frequency uh, is indicated by particularly the red uh, and the orange and yellow number uh, uh, coloration. And you can see in Central and Northern Europe, you have a lot of red and orange. But when you look at South Africa, uh, at the tip of Africa, it's all blue. If you go to Asia, uh, Thailand, uh, and a lot of China, you see a lot of dark blue, which is most people do not express express lactase in the small intestine, cannot tolerate fresh milk well, or cannot tolerate lactose-containing milk. Now, the interesting thing is that I want to bring up, it's not always limited to what we expect. In this case, what we now know, and these are very new uh, findings, uh, the lactase cleaves all kinds of glucosides. So a glucoside is basically a glucose attached to another molecule. In the case on the right uh, of lactose, this is galactose glucoside. So it's a galactose and a glucose. And the lactase splits it right in the middle. But it also does this with certain flavonoids where uh, or other natural compounds. Uh, here, example, anthocyanin. These are the uh, bioactive compounds, particularly in berries uh, that make berries so colorful. This in particular is one that you would see in raspberries and blueberries and give it that intense bluish purple color. And the lactase, actually is the enzyme that cleaves off that glucose and thereby enables uh, absorption. If it's not cleaved off, it doesn't get really absorbed effectively. So uh, it gives us a hint uh, why adults do not uh, express uh, usually uh, lactase in the small intestine unless they habitually uh, from a re they are from a region where they come from an ancestry of cattle herders and uh, populations that are adapted genetically uh, to high lactose intake. So this is uh, the kind of thing we have to think about. We think about lactase and then we say about it and say, oh yeah, sure, it has to do with lactose uh, intolerance and all that stuff, but we have to think broader and recognize that many of these um, variations have broader consequences. So in this case, you need to, to consume about twice as much uh, fruits uh, if you want to get the same effect uh, as somebody who can digest uh, these these uh, bioactive compounds, right? Just think about it. Uh, if you do not have lactase genetically as an adult, uh, then you need to consume about twice as much blueberries or other fruits to have the same benefits as somebody who um, expresses lactase. And this is, these are the data 
uh, just for your interest. And you can see uh, we can look at a particular genetic variant here. Uh, genotype CC is um, two copies of the high activity lactase expression. Uh, key T are the ones who uh, express very little, if any, uh, lactase as adults. And what you can see, uh, if you go uh, CC on the left to TT on the right, that uh, basically uh, these metabolites that result when you absorb uh, these bioactives are about twice as uh, much uh, if you have um, uh, the active form TT in this case. And on under there, there are several other metabolites, but the top uh, row is the combination of all of them. I want to conclude and uh, try not to take too much time uh, with our fourth use case. That is something that we encounter on a daily basis. That is the DRIs and specifically recommended daily allowances because they work on the assumption that nutrient requirements uh, center around a single value with slight differences due to continuous uh, variables such as weight or exercise. So yeah, you know, if somebody uh, is, is, has a higher body weight, then you have a higher requirement problem. That's kind of factored in. And the way uh, currently the RDAs, the recommended daily allowances are set, are to estimate here, which is uh, the median uh, requirement. So at that level, at that intake level, you have as many people that don't quite meet their requirements as people who exceed the requirements. So that's the median. And then the current model posits that adding two standard deviations to that uh, middle, to that ear, generates the RDA. And the expectation is, as you can see from that graphic, that uh, about 97 to 98% of the population, of the otherwise healthy population, uh, gets enough of that particular nutrient. And that goes for a wide range of nutrients. It goes for folate or um, riboflavin, et cetera, et cetera. But what we now know, as you saw, is, well, for folate, for instance, these requirements are not the same. And you remember that. And when we uh, calculate it out, from normal distributions, then you can see this is not a nice bell curve. This is a much uglier uh, animal uh, with uh, multiple peaks and, and tops, where you can clearly see, as would be obvious anyway from the bar graph that we looked at, that there is a sizable uh, population that has a much higher a folate requirement, and that those 400 micrograms that are currently recommended uh, are not enough for many more than the two or three percent that the uh, recommendations posit. So this is just food for thought that when we uh, take into account that we're not all the same, that that there are different forms. Uh, categorical variables. Here we talked mostly about genetics, but uh, same about the others, uh, sex, male, females. We cannot assume that it's all nice and continuous, and we have to take that into account. So the key uh, takeaways here are that uh, we have to pay attention to relevant genetic diversity. And once we know or read about something, then we cannot pretend, oh, they're all the same, and then 
you know, you do the same recommendation or you do the same uh, study design, nutritional study design, or on a on a population uh, level, of course, you also have to factor that out. And if you know uh, 10, 20% of a population is particularly vulnerable, then that's an opportunity, but also a need to take that into account for policy, but also for other planning like food production, et cetera. And uh, really, the uh, intake recommendations uh, concern a very broad uh, uh, range of people. So much for here. Thank you. Thanks for your attention. I think we have time for maybe a couple of questions. Well, thank you very, very much. That was very, very interesting. <laughs> we can start the, the Q&A session now. Would you mind uh, stopping the screen sharing so we can see everybody? Yeah, I was trying, just trying to find it. Okay. Yes. Well, thank you very much. So I'll start start with the, some questions. Um, my first one, you know, I was listening to your presentation. I'm, I'm just thinking about what do you think are the most pressing challenges the field of nutrigenetics is facing today? I would say the most pressing challenge is that it's taken seriously enough. I mean, I get every single day, I would say, the thing, oh, are we there yet? Is it really ready for prime time? And my my stock answer is we have been for decades, right? Uh, we have used uh, targeted nutrition interventions based on genetics mm -hmm. and we are just not thinking about it so as soon as you start thinking about let's say pku phenylketonuria or other inborn errors of metabolism yes we use genetics we study those affected children and we make a targeted intervention which is very different uh, from the one that unaffected children get. The only difference is that we now recognize that so many more people are in, involved. Basically, everybody has genetic variants that need attention because there are so many. And the question is not, are we there yet? It is, for which of these relationships do we know enough to use mm -hmm. for a particular purpose? Right, so we are there yet. Clearly, for PKU, we are there already for a few others, and it's just like lab values. Probably uh, many of you are familiar with the typical lab report, where it says, "Okay, you have such a uh, creatinine concentration that tells me about how your kidneys are functioning." or you have such and such a uh, cholesterol level and that tells me what kind of uh, action you might need to take, right? Lots of examples. And uh, of course, you use that information as needed, right? We do it every day. Anybody who has anything uh, to do in clinical practice or dietary, dietetics, we use it all the time. It's We have to just stop thinking about genetics as some kind of extraterrestrial UFO uh, that is so weird. It's just who we are. I mean, for instance, we all very comfortable with the concept of blood groups, mm -hmm. right? It's how we think about these things. So it doesn't become a question, are we there yet? It becomes a question for a particular, let's say, MTHFR and folate. Are we there yet? Yes, we are. Right? It's not a package that where, you know, it either works or it doesn't work. Right. It's one at a time. I think that's the biggest challenge to really recognize that, that uh, it is one at a time, just like we use a cholesterol level, mm -hmm. uh, or we don't. Yeah, we just need good evidence for that. We use, let's say, blood sodium concentration 
to understand, you know, what's the state of that particular patient or the individual. If you have very low sodium in blood, you have a problem, right? And then you take action. For most people, it's irrelevant because most people have a totally normal, regular, very boring uh, mm -hmm. concentration of sodium, et cetera. So it's not a question, can we use genetics in practice? It becomes a question in what context and for what particular uh, diagnostic. So it's one at a time. Uh, as soon as you demonstrate uh, the PKU, you have made the point, right? And then it becomes only a matter of how many more of, of those interactions do we have enough evidence? Mm -hmm. And that is growing constantly. But, you know, it's we cannot say the other way around, oh, just because we know it for PKU, now we can be confident with everything that is being offered uh, commercially. Right? They have big lists of genetic variants and claims. No, it has to be proven and demonstrated. You need evidence support for every single one. Mm -hmm. The next one is totally unrelated. It's a new day, a new categorical var variable. So that's, in, in my mind, that's the biggest challenge uh, that people uh, particularly, you know, professionals and other stakeholders think about it the right way. And everything else flows from that. Right. You, you would say, okay, you know, for this particular purpose of this particular interaction, I need more data, right? Or maybe I decide it's good enough. It's not different from a lot of other applications, right? We Very need true. to know yes. how much protein somebody needs. Yeah, sure. But now, you know, we know there is more. And now we have to start getting serious and digging in. But again, for, for all of you who are trying to make sense of this, mm -hmm. the basic concept that people are different and literally everybody is different from somebody else, right? Right. Even twins are different, right? Uh, so it's not a question of who has a variant. Everybody has some kind of variant. And, and everybody has, from what we know now, at least two or three variants of nutritional consequence, where you say, oh, you know, maybe you need a little bit extra vitamin C. I have no clue that... This would exist. Yeah, we know. We know those things. True. So that's that's where I see the challenge. Thank you. Thank you. Catherine. Yeah, quick question. So quick question. I was just curious. So should we <clears throat> be advising individuals that are considering taking, for example, folate supplement to reduce um, risk reduction for some um conditions such as colorectal cancer to under, undergo genetic testing because we showed that there are individuals that have the deletion um, genes for the methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase versus those. And, and this particular ex example, mm -hmm. your particular question, mm -hmm. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. For the very simple reason, because I wouldn't recommend folic acid anyway. Yeah. We already get, you know, from fortified flour, particularly, mm -hmm. and flour-derived uh, foods. Mm -hmm. uh, what you want to do is you want to get lots of food folate, which is in citrus, mm -hmm. which is in legumes, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's in, in soy. Uh, you know, that's the apples and orange mm -hmm. comparison, mm -hmm. right? Apples mm -hmm. contain no folate. And uh, oranges are a very rich source of folate. So should you distinguish between, you know, fruits? Absolutely. And if you get enough from these good sources, I forget to mention, I knew I forgot one. It's the uh, 
dark green yeah. um, uh, vegetables, right? Mm -hmm. So spinach and kale and um, broccoli, they are the real heroes. Mm -hmm. But I mean, you have lots of sources. So uh, I think if you want to talk to somebody about what they need, I would not say, oh, first you have to do a genetic analysis. I would say, make sure uh, you get enough of these particular food groups because you don't have the risk I was showing from folic acid. Mm -hmm. You don't have to worry about that for food folate. Okay. This is only a supplement okay. issue. Mm -hmm. And then you're already covered. And you find the same thing. It's what hap What's happening is in many cases, the vulnerability is increased. But when you follow current recommendation or, you know, do particularly well, right? So you get a good uh, amount of food folate, then you're good, even if you have that vulnerability. So that's where I see it. And then you can say, okay, uh, Yes, there might be some benefit and, you know, people are working on it. I'm particularly interested in it to start basically fine tuning your uh, nutrition profile and what you eat uh, based on what kind of genetics you have. Mm -hmm. There is going to be benefit, but the big benefit is already from having good nutrition. And interestingly, most of the time, it's not from supplements. So for a long time, we have known that multivitamins uh, are not a benefit, unless you have a particular need, let's say for pregnancy. But even there, you want to recommend uh, food first. Mm -hmm. I think that's the big takeaway. Now, in terms of policy, Yes, it is very important to understand, for instance, particular populations, you may have paid attention to the lactase uh, story, right? Uh, we know which kind of populations um, uh, tend to not express lactase in the small intestine, right? So they, it's, it's less than 5% or so of people from Thailand who have lactase. So you already know, okay, you know, maybe they need more fruits and vegetables. Fortunately, that tends to be a population mm -hmm. that has pretty good intake of these critical uh, fruits and you know. But I mean, we can we can make conclusions about populations. And uh, as I said, you know, when you formulate recommendations, then you do have to take into account the current system doesn't work because it ignores vulnerable groups. Right. Dr. Peterson, did you have a comment? Well, kind of already talked about it. I'm, I'm really interested in this whole folic acid story. I mean, I've, I've been around long enough to remember the debate going on before folic acid was mandated back in 1998. In, yeah. in a, a public health attempt to reduce neural tube defects, which it has somewhat, but that's definitely not the entire story. But given the data you just showed, I mean, uh, it seems to me we're trying to fix a problem, uh, i.e., you know, neural tube defects, et cetera, when the real problem is people aren't eating fruits and vegetables, right? Uh, I mean, yes. And, and so that that just seems so myopic. I think it's such a nice paradigm, it's such a nice use case where you can do, again, you know, advocate for food first. Mm -hmm. It will not apply the same in every instance, but right. in terms of folate, it most yeah. certainly does. Mm -hmm. and, you know, sometimes, you know, the, the consequences are not always understood, but we have to understand that these data, particularly the ones from the uh, Long Island breast cancer study, old. They have been around for a long time, and it's a matter of context. Do we take it seriously or not? And, you know, most of these things have been dismissed, and people feel comfortable. Oh, we do, as you say, um, the neural tube defect prevention is a, a huge success. There's no question. More than 3,000 cases mm -hmm. per year are prevented in the U.S., 
But I mean, the question is, number one, if we do fortification, why do we use folic acid? Well, it's more stable and gives shelf life. Americans love long shelf life. They love to have things sitting on the shelf for a month, right? When, you know, maybe fresh, fresh food would be better. But that doesn't have such a long shelf life. So, I mean, we know why these things are done, but, you know, that's maybe a little bit of a shift uh, that we have to push, that we say, okay, if you have to fortify, maybe you have to use a different form of different met folate metabolite, which are available, that just cost more. They are less stable. So. Thank you very much. I think we're out of time here, but that was such a great presentation. And I'm sure like, yeah. we just have a lot of graduate students let, who appreciate it. Let me just say, if anybody has questions, I'm uh, very happy to answer them. Just shoot me an email. Thank you. If everybody could just unmute their mics and give Dr. Kohlmeier a round of applause. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. That was great. I wish you a lot of success. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.